Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. Crime and the tea and the crime. No, oh. <laughs> so usually it's just the tea and the crime, but yeah, we can add an extra crime up top. Actually, I do have a crime against humanity. Oh, S- Slappy, yeah, is back and he is better than ever. Like I said, Slappy's helping me run an imaginary baseball clinic every morning for my son, and so he sits on the front porch and he signs all the kids in and gives them water. And I think. I think the neighbors probably really like it. If I lived near you, I would be terrified. <laughs> you just move. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, no, nah, or I'd just I just wouldn't walk by your house probably. The worst part is, is because Slappy is a daily occurrence again. I don't bring him upstairs and put him back in my son's room. I just put him on like a chair in the front room, and I realize <laughs> that people have come over, and I he's just been there, oh, and nobody no, said you're anything. One of those but people. I after, after they leave, I think, oh god. They probably had questions and are talking about that as soon as they get in the car. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Yeah. But he's back. And, you know, he's a really good baseball coach. So you might want to be a little bit more open-minded about him. No. (laughs) He really motivates the children. I will crime at him. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) Stop it. uh, We can post some pictures of him being a great baseball coach. Did I say you where he's wearing a hat? No, yeah, oh. yes, you did. Okay, yeah, that's one of my faves. He's ready to rock. But anyway, what do you got? What's new before we get into your tea? I don't think I have any crimes against humanity like that. Yeah, nothing crazy. Another bunk bed situation. So maybe that is a crime against humanity. What's going on in but... your life that you're an adult woman who keeps <laughs> I'm in being a lot in of bunk group beds? events? <laughs> Granted, I am not. But this one's way better because I know them so much more. Sure. This is rugby. It's right, your rugby team. It's better, but. Like, they couldn't spring for a hotel and some queen bed situation going on? It was a queen. It was like a big bunk bed. Not the top. The top was not a queen. They were both. They're probably. What's the one right under queen? Full. Yeah. They're they're fulls. Double. They're double and full the same. I can't remember. I I always mix those up. You know, I don't know because I'm an adult and I haven't looked back from queen bed once I hit that. I slept. A f- I slept fine. So, did you have to share the twin bed, or were you solo? No, there was a risk of that, but two people ended up coming. So, wait, I'm sorry. You would have had to share the bed in a bunk bed. Correct. Okay, I can't live. One your life. of us would. I can't. <laughs> I can't do any of the things you do. <laughs> <sighs> I would have just flat out said, "I'm going to need my own bed. <laughs> if we're in a bunk bed, I'm going to need my own. So, you guys pick amongst yourselves." Yeah, you you would have been fine. You would have. Oh yeah, would have been fine. And then I would have I would have excelled at rugby as well. <laughs> I just like to think about me in your life, <laughs> and how I just miserably fail at every turn. Your job, you would fail. Everything. You would just be miserable. I, I'm pretty sure I would be out immediately of the game. What about basketball, Meg? Yeah, sh- but you're not playing basketball. I know, but that's that same ferocity. I could see it. Yeah, it's a little. I think rugby is more intense than basketball. It is. It's anyway. just more violent. Anyways. You live your life. Let's get to the violent stuff. Oh, no. We do teas no, first. No, tea. Okay. Do you not know the format? You've already messed it up. Who, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> Wait, where am I? Today, we have Kiki's Bakery Lemon Cake, which is a nod to Kiki's Delivery Service. If any of you have seen that film, it's from our friends at Riddle's Tea Shop. We've shown a few other of their teas. So this is a black tea because it's early and I need some caffeine. We have natural almond flavor, lemon flavor, cream, marigold, your favorite, Ugh. and lemon peels. Just the peels. So, as, well, zest, just I guess. Just the peels. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I could smell it right away. So I think they did a good job with that. I put a splash of milk in because it is a black tea, but I could tell... 
you, sometimes you just know if it's not going to be too strong. Okay. That was a good slurp. Mmm. Oh, I was a little ner- nervous about this because usually I like lemon and herbal teas. You're always nervous about the tea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's fruited. Fruited. Fruit. <laughs> it's fruited. Oh, but this is nice. Oh, that's a very enthusiastic face. It, it like glides down your throat. There's a there's a, actually a nice body on it. Like you could grab onto it. Ooh. The lemon comes through really beautifully. It is like a like a lemon pound cake where it's nice and smooth in the middle. You get that, you know, the the icing of the lemon as it goes down. So I would give this a zesty thumbs up. Yeah, lemon zest makes sense. Yep. All right. Sounds delish. Yum. Okay. Ready to get into the case today? Yes. It's cases, actually, plural. Oh, what do you call this? Compilation. There's a word for it. Yes. In the U.S., over 600,000 people are considered missing every year. That's a lot. I know. That's why I just double-checked that Holy statistic. Holy shit. What? I was like, is that right? Did I add a zero? I, I tend to do that a lot. Are you serious? I just looked it up twice. Wow. Because I, I thought I... No, I'm not I'm not questioning you. I just, my mind can't. Well, 600,000 people. How many people live in the U.S.? Okay. I need wow. to just research. Yeah. Nas- National Missing and Unidentified Persons. And we have 333 million people. So I guess that could work. Wow. Over 600,000 each year. But the majority of those are resolved quickly. I see. It's like people who like ran away from home for a second. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So majority are resolved quickly. But obviously, we know here at Tea Time Crimes that there's still plenty of cases of abductions, runaways, foul play, or just unsolved mysteries where nobody knows what happened. Yeah. But I fell down a rabbit hole of what happens when somebody disappears in a national park because oh. the same theories all apply. All of those possibilities are still out there. They could have been an abduction. They could have yeah. wanted to to disappear. They could have been murdered, but they also have animals and the elements to consider. Now, the majority of the time, they're missing hikers who have been injured or got turned around and they're just kind of waiting for help and they're found and recovered. Yeah. But there are others who seem to completely vanish into thin air. So I'm going to cover a few cases today that are just wild. So the first one is Glenn and Bessie Hyde. Bessie was born in 1905. I'm still going to do historical for you for the most part because I know you don't Love that. Okay. So Bessie was born in 1905 in a small West Virginia town. And she did what girls her age at that time are supposed to do. She married her high school boyfriend, Earl. Cue up Earl had to die because that's the song that's in my head for this whole research. But it wasn't (laughs) long before Bessie grew tired of Earl. I don't know that he was the Earl of that music video, but she just wasn't that interested. And he wasn't interested in her. Wasn't going great. She wanted a divorce. Earl said no which you could do at that time. So that's fun. Ah! With few legal options at her disposal in the 1920s, Bessie picked up and left town, leaving her stubborn husband behind and moving to San Francisco. In 1927, Bessie decided to take a boat down to Los Angeles. I think it was a fun sightseeing tour. And on that trip, she met Glenn Hyde, a 29-year-old farmer from Idaho, and fell head over heels in love quickly because... How long is a boat ride from San Francisco to L.A.? You know what I mean? Because hashtag potatoes. Yeah. Well, potatoes are delicious. That right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So Bessie contacted Earl again. It's like, hey, let's do this divorce. I don't. We don't even live together. Come on now. Send a selfie of her and Glenn. Yeah. Yeah. She mailed a sketch of her and Glenn. <laughs> and Earl said no. Earl's a real... He sounds really reasonable. Why would you want to be with someone you don't want to be with? Anyways. I know. Finding somewhat of a loophole, Bessie moved to Nevada, which was a state that allowed women to divorce without their husband's permission, but you had to be a resident there for six months. Okay. So she moved there, established residency, and by the spring of 1928, Bessie was finally divorced from Earl, and she married Glenn in Twin Falls, Idaho on April 10th. She was just 23 years old, although some sources will say she was even younger. And he's 29. Yeah. Glenn grew up riding the rapids of the Snake River, and he wanted a rafting trip for their honeymoon. The plan was to start in Utah at the Green River, 
to the Colorado River, through the Grand Canyon, and in Needles, California. Few had ever made that trip, and Bessie would be the first woman to make that trip. Okay. So the two spent all summer in Idaho building their boat. They built it themselves. God. And they left on October 20th with hopes of arriving in California the first week of December. But here's the thing. Glenn really loved a type of boat called a scow, which is a big flat-bottomed boat. <laughs> which, Sorry, I just have that song stuck in my head every time I say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fat-bottomed, right? Fat bottom girls. Yeah. Yeah. The rock and we'll go <laughs> that song. Every time I'm like, flat, flat bottom boat. Where have I heard that? <laughs> so it's maybe not ideal for a rafting. And oh, because like I could get like, I see. It's not aerodynamic at all. He's on. Yeah. It's a barge, basically. Right. With right. Small and you're like sides. going through very narrow and like rocky shit. Yeah, and and he insisted on doing it with no protective gear. I don't know the technology of protective gear in the 1920s, but no, not even life jackets. Okay. I mean, geez. Yeah, experienced river folk took one look at that boat when they pulled in to Utah, and they all just said, nah, you, you shouldn't do that. And they did it. So to be honest, oh, with no. this trip, Glenn was really hoping to get a little bit of fame along with a fun adventure. That was his goal. I see. He thought it would bring some notoriety to them. And to his credit, they made it from Utah to Bright Angel Trail in record time. Things were going really well. Okay. They stopped to visit a friend at the Grand Canyon named Emery Kolb. He's a landscape photographer who was famous for his photographs of the Grand Canyon. And he was an experienced rafter. He'd been down the river before and reminded the hides who were pumped off their record-breaking first part of the trip that the most dangerous part of the river was still ahead. Emery even tried to get the hides to stay with him through the winter and attempt it later on. Mm. That's how worried he was because Ugh. it's November right now. Yeah. And they refused. And when they refused, he still tried by at least getting Glenn to agree to use a life jacket. And Glenn said no. Y'all... All right, we can talk about this later. Emery never saw his friends again. Yeah. The last known sighting of Glenn and Bessie was at a hotel in the Grand Canyon. That was on November 15th. But no one knew they were missing until well into December. Oh, no. Because they're not supposed to arrive the, in yeah. California until December. And who are they checking in with? Right. By December 18th, the search for them was in full force. They had two planes, each with a pilot and a mechanic. They were prepared to drop provisions if they were spotted. Oh, cool. So they would drop the provisions and then they would tell the land rescuers where, where to you know, get them out. Yeah. The search was moving between the Grand Canyon and Needles, California. And I'm not sure what the area is like today, but in the 1920s, it was fairly isolated and it was peppered with Native American communities. And the papers reported that groups of Native Americans participated in the land search trying to help find the couple because this was, oh, you know, they nice. knew the area better than yeah. most people. They lived there. The hope here was that Bessie and Glenn had survived a boat wreck and were somewhere in the canyon alive. But when the aerial search found nothing, the experienced search and rescue in the water, there are also people rafting, had only been able to cover 11 miles in 12 hours due to weather. Oh, man. And that's not, that's not a lot. The outlook started to look pretty grim. But still holding out hope, Glenn's father had offered a $1,000 reward for anyone who could find his son and daughter-in-law. Mr. Hyde even started his own search in the desert with his theory being that the couple had survived the wreck and then climbed out of the canyon and were on the other side of it in the desert. Okay. I mean, everything is pointing to a, a wreck in the water. But they haven't found a wreck. No, even with life jackets in the river, that area would be brutal. Yeah. I mean, raging river. Exactly. You get tossed around, hit against a rock, you're done. Exactly. But on December 19th, this is weeks after the couple failed to show up at their final stop now, their boat was found in perfect condition. <gasps> what? It was not overturned. It had not sustained any damage. And all the supplies were still locked in place. What? Even Bessie's journal and camera were there untouched. Isn't that strange? That's bizarre. 
you'd think even if if they were thrown from the boat, it would have had damage from a collision and it would have thrown them off or the boat itself would have just flipped over. Yeah. Even with that, still the most likely theory is that the couple drowned in the river and their bodies weren't recovered. Yeah. There are, I'm sure, some scenarios where the boat could have left them untouched or you wouldn't have seen the damage. And maybe one of them was trying to rescue the other or something. Sure. But there are several odd occurrences that make people wonder what really happened and if Bessie survived. Just Bessie. Yeah, here's one. A package was received by Ms. Balula Roth, which is a friend of Bessie's, at the end of December. It contained an ornament for Christmas that had been delivered from Idaho where the Hydes live or lived on December 13th, about a week after Bessie was supposed to have returned from the trip. There was only a holiday card in it and Bessie had signed it. What? And inside was a Christmas ornament and, and that was it. What? Isn't that weird? I mean, that has to yeah. be just a coincidence, right? She must have asked somebody to mail it for her. But I, I started thinking, gosh, what if she was really on the run and has anybody smashed open the Christmas ornament? Maybe there's something inside it. Maybe there's a secret message or something. Whoa. But that was odd. People were wondering if something, you know, is she alive? Now, number two, Emery, their friend, the photographer, he passed away decades after Bessie and Glenn went missing, and Emery lived on the canyon. After his death, they're clearing out his property in his boathouse, in a canoe, was an entire male skeleton. What? Immediately, everybody assumes it's Glenn Hyde. This is 20 years later? More like 50 years later. Whoa. And the stories are raging that Emery murdered Glenn to be with Bessie, but it doesn't even make sense. Well, where's Bessie? Is she just in hiding in the canyon for the last 50 years and nobody ever realized that Emery had a wife? Imagine. Anyway, turns out the bones belong to a male, but between the ages of 20 and 23, who had been shot with a revolver in the 1920s. So it was dicey for a while. I mean, the age is a little off. It ended up being a man who had died by suicide in the National Park. I still don't know why Emery had the skeleton in his canoe. Yeah, that's still very strange. But it was believed that Emery did not murder this man. Okay. Now three, a rafting pioneer by the name of Georgie Clark died at the age of 81 in 1992. After losing her teenage daughter in 1944 to a hit-and-run driver, Georgie just mm. left her life, and she started hitchhiking and then threw on a life jacket and started floating down the portions of the river in the Grand Canyon with a friend. And then she started rafting. And then she started tying rafts together, and it kind of became the prototype for whitewater rafting trips, and she would guide people down the river so they could see it. Cool. Years later, the 24-mile rapid portion of the river was renamed to honor Georgie Clark, who some oh. believe was Bessie Hyde. <gasps> After Georgie's death, friends were cleaning out her home, and apparently Georgie had lived alone, was pretty isolated, and she never had anyone in her house, even though she had friends. So they'd never seen it. Really? Inside, they found a copy of Georgie's birth certificate, and her birth name was Bessie DeRoss. Bro! But Bessie Hyde's maiden name was not DeRoss. Here we go. They also said they found a marriage license for Bessie and Glenn. Uh, uh, this, this is and a gun that looks the same as one Bessie was holding in a picture. It's her. But Georgie and Bessie don't look alike and are different heights. It's not her. But that, <laughs> no. that lady killed her and took I mean, her stuff. That lady knew who she was, right? Something. I don't know. What the fuck? Or like she found it somewhere and she like collects yeah. all things. Maybe she found it. I want to meet her. Or maybe she helped Bessie escape. Oh. I don't know. Anyway. I want to know her. But she wouldn't have encountered Bessie in the 1920s. She wasn't on the river till later, right? I, I don't know. But number four. Wow. In 1971, there had been a woman with a group of, of rafters. They were going on a guided rafting tour. And she was alone on the trip. You know, a lot of people come with a group of friends or, yeah. you know, somebody else. She was alone and she was pretty introverted and pretty shy. The group pulled up to camp at the same spot where Bessie and Glenn had gone missing. And the guide starts telling this legend, right, this story. And the woman speaks up. And she hasn't really talked at all this whole trip. And she says, yeah, I know. I'm Bessie. Uh, 
She what? went on to say that she stabbed Glenn to death after he hit her during a fight because she was wanting to leave the trip when it was too dangerous. Seems excessive use of force. Later, well, he hit her, and so she protected no, herself. No, I know, but like, and stabbed him. Later, the woman denied the story, said she'd never heard that, and she doesn't know why they're saying that. But people on the trip felt like she was telling the truth, and they felt like she was lying when she denied it. Bessie! So that became another theory. <sighs> and so today, nobody knows what happened to Glenn and Bessie Hyde, but that's Bessie. there are so many theories where Bessie thinks, or where they think Bessie survived. What do you think? Yeah. I think it's number four. I wanted it to be number three, but I think it's number four. <laughs> you just want it to be number four. I don't know. Why would she just I mean, if blurt that a out? A bunch of witnesses. Well, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to like just say who you are? Say it. Yeah, probably. You know? Yeah, I don't know. Like, what are these people going to do? Yeah, I'll just deny it later. I mean, the most likely scenario is that they drown. But why was everything perfectly intact with the boat? It doesn't make sense. Especially the journal. I feel like they parked the boat somewhere. Yeah. And got in a fight. But what happened what happened to Glenn? One of them has to be deceased because I think Glenn's dead. They're both not keeping that secret. Then where's Glenn? Is Glenn the skeleton in the canoe and Bessie killed him and then was like, Emery, please help me? No, because that didn't match up, right? Yeah. Didn't they identify it as somebody else? They didn't do DNA. They just superimposed Glenn's face on the skeleton. But I know you can tell by skeletal markers. Oh, so interesting. I just think it's weird that Emery would keep a skeleton in his canoe. It, it very weird. It's very weird, right? Why would you do that? Unless you also, were... Also, did it go through the whole decomp process? Oh, it was, God. it was just a skeleton, yeah. So he would have just left it there and let it do that. I mean, I don't know what state he found it. That it, right. That's us assuming that right. it was a, you know. But why would she also carry Glenn's body back to him? I don't, that seems like extreme. Maybe and they, they said it wasn't. They together. said they believe it was a man who took his own life, but. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Like, all we know, we don't know that much about Glenn. All we know is that he's very reckless, but we don't know if he's mean. Yeah, we don't know if he's or if he has a nasty guy. streak or violent or nice. Yeah, so it's like like he he's pretty dumb and reckless. Like he just won't <laughs> take any advice or at least naive. Yeah, but is he did did something happen where they got in a fight? Because like here's the thing, I think something nefarious had to have happened because otherwise Bessie would have come out and say like he's missing, I can't find him, or he drowned, or like freak out. If she survived, yeah. To the public officials, yeah. And I think she did, for the record. You think it would, I think that would have been the most easy explanation too, to just say he fell off the boat. Yeah. And she could have gone back to her life. That seems extreme yeah. to me, to not. So I think she probably killed him or her and Emery or something. I don't know. Emery seems like a solid dude, except for the weird skeleton part. <laughs> Emery seems amazing, except that he keeps <laughs> skeletons in his boathouse. Couldn't do that. That's a little odd, but you know what? Nobody is no. perfect. You know what I mean? Nobody is perfect. <laughs> Red flag. All right. Next one. Mary Catherine Van Olst. Van Olst. On June 16th, 1946, eight-year-old Mary <gasps> Catherine Van Olst disappeared in Devil's Den State Park. This park is located in West Fork, Arkansas, in the southwest section of the Ozarks. For almost 30 years, Mr. and Mrs. Van Olst hadn't been on a vacation. They had been busy raising six children, and if they could find the time, they couldn't always find the money. But in 1946, only three of those six children were still at home. The others had grown up. So they decided to take a road trip from Kansas to Fort Smith, Arkansas. And along the way, they pulled off to visit Devil's Den State Park. The children, Catherine and her two older brothers, Bobby and Jean, ran to the swimming hole once they got there. And right away, her brothers, who are older but still young, they start fishing and they kind of, you know, go swim, Mary Catherine, right? It's here that Mary Catherine encountered her first bit of bad luck, and she almost drowned. A nearby couple- Is that why it's called Devil's Den? No. A nearby couple a pulled her out of the water at the last minute and shook her until she spit up water. <laughs> well, she actually threw it up. Or they shook her upside down. Why are you laughing? It's just a funny way to do it. She was very upset by that. And her brothers recovered from the incident once they realized their sister was okay, and they just go back to fishing. But Mary Catherine is upset because she was just hung upside down by a stranger until she yeah. threw up, and she was 
thinking, I'm going to go find my mom and dad. That was awful. So she turns around, leaves her brothers, starts making her way back to camp. But she never got there. As soon as the Van Alts realized their daughter was missing, a search began for the eight-year-old. Their hope, of course, is that Mary Catherine, she just got turned around. She must be nearby, right? She's only eight. She's barefoot. She's in a bathing suit. She can't be far. As night fell, there was still no sign of the little girl. Mm. And as the search continued into the next few days, it started to rain, making it even harder Mm -hmm. for searchers to cover as much terrain as they were hoping. After the third day, Mary Catherine's father, John, collapsed from stress and fatigue. He had not stopped looking for his daughter since she went missing, and his body couldn't take it anymore. After that, the sheriff forbade John to participate in the search and put him under protective custody. And I don't know if it was because he was trying to protect John or if he thought John was guilty. What? There were a few sources that hinted at John being a suspect in the disappearance. So the search continued. On day six, Porter Chaddock, a veteran and a college student, heard a small voice say, here I am. Porter looked up and was shocked to see Mary Catherine calmly standing right in front of him, walking out of a small cave. What? So somehow, this eight-year-old was about 10 miles from her parents' camp. And that's 10 miles if you were to fly. So that's not going over rugged terrain. Yeah, as the crow flies. That's not going over rugged terrain or like, you know, mountain trails are never straight. And she also had no shoes on. So this would have been barefoot. And the forest is so dense at this time that two years prior, an adult woman had also gotten lost and she was found dead 17 days later. She was 50 yards from an access road, but the forest was so oh, thick she couldn't see it. Oh, God. It's a quite literally a miracle. They're surprised that she's yeah. this far away and that she's okay. According to Mary Catherine, she left the swimming hole trying to get back, got lost, and walked until it was dark. The first night she slept in the grass, and then when it started to rain, she went into this cave. She had heard the calls for help from the searchers who were close by, and she called back, but they never heard her. She had also heard the search dogs, but she was too scared of them, and she stayed in her cave. After the second day, the child admitted she thought she would die there. The cave had a small pool of water. She drank from that. And there also were blackberry bushes nearby, and she ate those to stay alive. Foraging, baby! Yeah, many pointed out that it was unbelievable that she only ate the blackberries because that area is covered in poisonous berries. And the fact that there were blackberries there and that that's all she ate. Wow. I wonder if her she grew up with the knowledge or something like that. I don't know. She's, of course, taken to the hospital right away. And John Van Alst, who was exiled from the search, you remember, didn't even find out yeah. until he read the paper the next morning because they couldn't get a hold of him. That's messed up. Yeah. Obviously, Mary Catherine needed nourishment and she was covered in bug bites. She said each night yeah. she'd have to pick the ticks off of her. Uh! Yeah. But otherwise, she was physically unharmed. She also received That's typhoid incredible. shots as a precaution because she'd been drinking cave water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only other physical effect that the child experienced was that her blonde hair turned brown while she was gone. And the doctors had no explanation for it. Turned brown? Isn't that strange? I assume like it's she grew just up the real stress. Quick? No, just a, it's it's almost as if the legend of if you scare somebody their hair will turn white. Yeah. It's almost like that. I think extreme stress right. and her hair just turned darker. Anyway, That's Mary, crazy. I know. Mary Catherine received an outpouring of support when she was found. Letters, gifts were sent to the hospital, and she was released af- after a few days. And she asked her parents for two things. One, she wanted to ride a pony. <laughs> and two, she'd like some fried chicken because she'd been on a liquid diet oh! <laughs> to recover because you can't just eat whatever you yeah. want when you've been yeah. starving. Her parents immediately took her to have both those things. She got to ride a pony, Aww. and then they went and got her a big, huge lunch of fried chicken. That's so sweet. I know. In 1997, Donald Bradley from the Kansas City Star did an interview with Mary Catherine, whose name is now Mary Williams, and she'd married, had two children of her own, was working at Sears, and Mary had some vivid memories, like she said she'll never forget that cave, but most of the ordeal was a blur to her, and she really couldn't remember how she got there or what happened. She remembers eating the blackberries and says she, to this day, she hates blackberries and won't eat them. (laughs) So the question that comes up out of this mysterious case, obviously this one has a happy ending, but yeah, how did she get that far? In research, you know, the, the miles vary. Some people say she was eight miles, some say she was 12, so I just split the difference. But in researching these cases, there are commonalities among these cases that are very odd. 
it will appear as if the person vanished into thin air, even if they're with a group or other hikers, and they don't really veer off the trail. They're just often just ahead of them, or they step to the right to go to the bathroom or something. And they're usually in a well-known area, but nobody sees anything. And trackers often have trouble finding footprints, which is always unusual. And dogs will often struggle to pick up scent. And there's almost always a coincidence of some sort of storm. And the fact that Mary Catherine traveled so far is a common theme among missing children cases as well, because there was a young boy mm. that went missing, his name with Keith Parkins in 1952 in Oregon. And I heard this case on the missing void. I linked it in the source notes so you can listen to the full episode. It's fascinating. There's other cases in there. But Keith was only two. And he's at his grandparents' house. Uh. He's playing outside with his brothers. His brothers go one way around the barn. He goes another. He's gone. Two. Two. There's no footprints, no sign of an animal attack. Hundreds of people take to the woods. How far can he get, right? Right. He's a fucking toddler. They didn't find any footprints until about four miles away from the house. And then four miles? Only for a few yards. So they can't find him. Night falls. The next morning, oh, temperatures were dangerously low. So everybody was freaking out. Oh, they continue no. the search. The very next morning in Skull Canyon, they find Keith nine miles from the house. What? Again, that's if you walk a straight line. Right. And I mean, toddlers are like fucking drunk people walking. I, I know, right? Zigzags. Yes. Now, Mary Catherine was the same way, but Keith was near death and almost frozen. His father held him to his body, sprinted back. He oh. survived, made a full recovery. But that's, it's that same question. Like, how did he get so far? And Keith is so much younger. Yeah. Did he remember it, I wonder, because he was so young? He didn't remember it at all. Yeah, because that's too young. There were theories of abductions because there weren't even footprints around the barn. Oh, like somebody scooped him. And like then somebody scooped him and left. Took off. But but there weren't any there. So they're like, well, if somebody had grabbed him, you'd think you'd see. But maybe there's so many people walking, it got what muddy. What if he like rode a dog? Or well, that was another quote. They thought, what if a bear or a mountain lion like picked him up? But they said there would have picked him up. There would have been drag marks and there would have been mountain lion or the bear tracks and there weren't any. Yeah. The other theory they came up with to explain this is that a bird picked him up. I mean, there are so, some huge raptors. I know, which is so scary. A bird picked him up and was car it carried him Dro that far. Dropped him. And then dropped him or placed him down. He, he did not have any physical damage except a few small scratches. What? And it's just the God, same thing. I would love to know what happened. How did Mary Catherine get that far? I, I, I think even an eight-year-old, you know, my son's seven, I don't think he would walk 10 miles you think he would just sit and give up at some point? Well, right? that's what she did, right? She just walked that first day and then was like, all right, I'm going to live here now. In fact, when she found yeah. the cave, I don't think she was walking a little bit every day. It sounded like she yeah. just walked until she found the cave and then she stayed there. I mean, the toddler, they tried to replicate this with adults and they couldn't make it as far as he had made it. So it's very mysterious. It freaks you out. Is, this some, is there a person out there who tried to abduct the child? I don't know. Anyway. What if they're anamorphs? What is that? Ah, <gasps> great book series in the 90s where it's these teenagers or preteens would turn into animals and they're like do stuff. Oh, so they morph into an animal? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there'd still be tracks, right? I know. That's wild. I wish I could know. I know. That's very interesting to me. All right. Next one, Polly Melton. So September 25th, 1981, started out like any other day for Thelma Pauline Melton, who goes by Polly. The 58-year-old Floridian was on her annual North Carolina summer trip with her husband, Robert. The Meltons and several other families would rent the same campground each year in the Smoky Mountains, and they'd stay from about April hmm. to November. Nice. It was a tight-knit group, so they didn't allow anybody into their circle unless everybody voted That's yes. A cult. No, no, it's it was, a cult. It was only like a group of you know, 10. Yeah. And quite regularly, Polly and her friends, Trula and Pauline, who went by Red, would hike the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And that day was no different. The three women meet up and they walk the Deep Creek Trail. It's right next to the campground. There's a waterfall, wildflowers. It's fairly level, clear cut, nice wide trail. And it's only a few miles. That Friday afternoon, the three set out around three o'clock. About an hour into their walk, they hit the turnaround and they start making their way back to camp. The women are chatting, laughing, just completely ordinary walk. When all of a sudden, Polly started to walk faster. So fast that she pulled in front of Trula and Red. 
Now, some sources say Polly started walking faster because her friends were picking on her about how slow she was walking. Others say they started picking on her when she started walking fast. But Polly started to leave them behind. And Polly was said to look back at them with somewhat of a smile and then keep going. Now, the two women, they knew the area well. So they knew there was a bench over the crest of the incline Polly was climbing. And so Red and Trula assumed she'd just stop at that bench, wait for them, and, you know, they'd have a good laugh about it. But that was the last time anybody saw Polly Milton. What? Of course, Trula and Red are not worried right away. When Polly isn't at the bench, they think, oh, she must have just kept walking and she's probably home. They had been teasing her about a man at church who seemed interested in her, and they thought, oh, maybe she was actually upset. Let's go find her. We'll apologize. We'll smooth things over. We must have just hit a nerve. So they go to the camp. They go right to her camper, ready to talk it out. Polly's not there. Her husband, Robert, is there, and he has not seen Polly either, and he's confused. He's like, she's with you. What are you talking about? Oh, God. So the three star walking around the campground hoping maybe somebody, you know, hey, come look at this. Hey, I got a question yeah. for you, Polly. Hoping she was talking to somebody else or she was in somebody else's camper. Nobody's seen her. <gasps> the group was growing concerned, but they still thought there has to be a simple explanation. It was broad yeah. daylight. She was right with us. The three women had been in this very well-populated area. It's very popular. It's also a pretty easy trail. So Polly was terrified of snakes and she never went off the trail. So she has to be okay. somewhere on the trail. Or she has to have run into somebody. That's the only logical explanation. So Trula, Red, and Red's husband, Jack, go back to the trail. They're going to walk it again, looking for Polly. Robert, her husband, stayed behind with the other campers, and he organized this kind of phone tree to call every location or person they could think of because the trail intersects with a parking lot. And so maybe she ran into Mm -hmm. somebody. Maybe she knew somebody, and it's still out of character for her, but that makes more sense than her just disappearing into thin air. By 6 o'clock, no one had heard from Polly, and they had not found a trace of her. They call the park ranger and report her missing. Ranger Dennis Burnett started his investigation right away. He's trying to understand what had Polly done that day? And was anything out of the ordinary? Did you see anybody weird, you know, lurking? Polly only did two things that were a break from her routine that day. One, every Friday, which the day was Friday, she volunteered to serve food to the elderly. But for some reason, she had not signed up for that day. She had not gone in. But then everything else was the same. She prepped dinner for her and her husband. She took a nap. Then she met the girls to go on this hike. But the second strange thing she did was on the hike, she just took off speed walking. Right. Now, Polly had high blood pressure and smoked two packs of Virginia Slims a day. So she usually kept a pretty slow to moderate pace. She wasn't trying to win any races. Yeah. So her walking fast never had happened before. But she could just be pissed and not want to be with her friends. So very quickly, the ranger has a search party. There's about 30 people out on the trail where Polly was last seen and looking on surrounding trails that could connect with it. And it's only been about two hours since she vanished. So they're stopping every hiker they encounter to see if they've seen Polly. Nobody has. More people start joining the search even as they're losing daylight. By midnight, there's not one single clue that could be used to say that Polly was even there. Robert, who's older and in his 70s and described in poor health, was so upset that he had to be hospitalized. With a disappearance like this, investigators are, of course, they're going to search the woods, but they also have to rule out that the missing person hasn't vanished intentionally. Yeah. Which at some point becomes a pretty viable theory here. People wonder if Polly wanted out of her marriage and her life or she was having an affair. But everyone in her life says that's not possible. Right. Were there hints of it? Robert was not Polly's first husband. She'd been married twice before and divorced twice. Her siblings pointed out if she wanted to leave, she simply would have just told Robert she was leaving. Yeah. And not run away from everybody in her life, right? Right. She has friends and family. They consider an animal attack, but there are no signs of it. It was believed by rangers that if that had been the case, Polly's body would have been recovered since the search started right. so quickly. And they would have seen signs of a struggle. And they didn't just search the trail. They searched the brush too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. they searched They searched the trail and then out from it. Yeah. The next viable theory is that Polly got hurt on the trail and was stuck somewhere. They were thinking for a while that maybe she had a head injury or a seizure and had become confused and then wandered off in the wrong direction uncharacteristically. Mm-hmm. The first night of her disappearance, the temperatures only got down to 50. So even though it would have been an unpleasant, scary night, she would have survived it, right? Yeah. But if she was hurt, they assume she'd be semi-close to the trail. Right. And they can't find her. It would have been wildly out of character for her to start blazing her own trail. But again, if she had a head injury, maybe. But even then, how far could she have gotten? She was not described as 
It's having endurance. <sighs> Someone took her. Rescue dogs were brought in, and only one of the dogs was able to pick up Polly's scent. <gasps> Missy, a bloodhound, went back to this fallen tree over and over again, giving the signal for Polly. <gasps> and it was a tree that many people used as a bench, and it was assumed that <gasps> Polly Melton had sat there before she disappeared. But Missy wasn't able to pick up the scent from that spot. She got taken. Yeah, if <laughs> taken. If Polly had just sat there to rest and then got up and meandered back, wouldn't the scent have been followed to the parking lot or wherever she was right. needing this other person to disappear? After a week on October 2nd, with still not one sign of Polly, the rangers called off the search. The search, the dogs, had all turned up nothing. Investigators assumed that Polly had gotten in a car. That's why the scent stopped. And since this area was so populated, their working assumption was that she did so on her own volition. This is mostly because they believe if Polly had been removed forcibly, others would have witnessed it. But I think some of the details that came out pushed investigators that way because it was discovered later that in addition to not signing up to volunteer Friday like she usually did, she had also used the phone at the center several times on Thursday, which she had never done before. She kept having to make calls, which was odd to people. Hmm. And she took blood pressure medication and her medication was still at the house. But Robert believed that he had a missing bottle of Valium. I don't know why she'd take that, but additional theories of Polly being depressed about her mother's death over the last few years were pointed to a reason for her departing on her own. But her friends and family thought it was much more likely that she was abducted or a victim of a robbery gone wrong. Yeah. To this day, no trace of Polly Melton has ever been found. At the time of her disappearance, Polly was 58 years old. She's described as Caucasian, 5 foot 10, short auburn hair, glasses, and brown eyes. She was wearing tan pants and a white and pink tank top. She'd also been wearing a watch made of white gold studded with diamonds and her wedding band. Just in case someone finds it. Yeah, just in case somebody finds it or it was pawned or something. But isn't that so bizarre? I think she was taken. Do you think? I think she was taken too. Like I know, I understand what they're saying. Like it's such a busy trail and like you'd be able to tell, but like, There are moments where the parking lot's not as busy or like you can, you know, someone can have a gun to you and you can't see it and be like, just keep going or I'm going to shoot you. And like the bloodhounds not being able to follow, like if there are so many people and there are cars, like that scent can get very distant and confused. Well, they, it was making me so mad because the papers kept saying they didn't think she was abducted because, and then they kept saying how much Polly weighed and they said because she was almost six feet tall and weighed, I forget what it was, but something that everybody would have seen it. And I was like, what are you talking about? First off, they could have held a gun to her back and told her to get in the car. Exactly. There could have been more than one, <laughs> you know? And, and then also, like, like you said, what if they waited until, what if they knocked her unconscious, pulled her to the side, and right. then waited until there was nobody in the parking lot? I mean, there's a, right. What if, there's right. also water nearby. What if they right. disposed of her body Yeah. in the creek? I mean, there's just so many... Just was making me so bad. I'm like, okay, calm down. That is, yeah. I mean, it's That's the same not. stupid, oh, oh, but she, if she was petite, then maybe. It's like, no, I mean, you can, what are you talking about? This, she, Polly's not a, a bodybuilder, for God's sake. She's a 58-year-old no. woman. Good yeah, Lord. Exactly. And not that that's even old, but I'm saying, like, she's a 58-year-old woman who smokes two packs a day and is walking in polyester right. pants. She's not... <laughs> She's not out there. I mean, she was. It's in her polyester damn pants. I was picturing like every outfit my grandmother ever wore since oh, I knew her, that's right? amazing. It's like that – it's the same time period. Like I, I can picture it so yeah, well what I she's wearing. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, come on. I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose it's possible that she could have just disappeared, but she had brothers and sisters and friends and phone calls are suspicious. Yeah, it doesn't sound right. They are suspicious, but how did nobody ever, ever hear from her again? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Obviously, I hope that... I'm leaning towards that, abduction. I know. I am too, but I hope that she ran away, even though that's... Yeah. Yeah. Awful, but then at least she'd be alive. Still awful for the people left behind. Yeah. Truly. Obviously, all these cases that I covered today are solved or happened so long ago that the missing person could no longer be alive because of old age. But there are so many cases that are more recent and families that are waiting for some sort of answer. And one of the cases I found that I didn't really have time to cover, and there really isn't any coverage on it, I just wanted to bring up because it kept, I just can't stop thinking about it. The only coverage I really found on it 
There are a few articles, a few news segments. There's a YouTube channel, Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. I linked it. Go ahead and listen to the whole thing. I'm going to summarize it, but he has way more details. Go ahead and take a listen. It's the 2015 disappearance of Alyssa Marie McCran. Now, I'm going to summarize it real quick, but go take a listen if you want the details. Now, Alyssa went missing on December 19th, 2015 in Oregon. And the case kept popping up in my research as a national park disappearance because her car was found at Monoma Falls parking lot. And this is a huge tourist attraction in Oregon. It's a huge waterfall. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but people come from all over to see it. So because her car was found there, folks assumed that is where she went missing. But Mm. when I read a little bit more, I'm not so sure because at the time of her disappearance, Alyssa was 37 years old with a 13-year-old son. The two of them live with her parents in Portland. Alyssa was super active and involved in social, and she went running the morning of her disappearance. She ran two and a half miles near her home. At 10 a.m., she posts on on social media, and then she answers a text around 11.30 that morning. After that, there is no sign of her, and no one heard from her again. What? Her last known phone location was tracked to Cascade Avenue in Tigard the morning of the 19th. And this location is about 20 to 30 minutes from her home. But then her car was found 45 minutes from Tigard. Now, witnesses at the park say they saw Alyssa on the running trails at 3 that afternoon. But this is the witness statement I question. Not nefariously. I, I wonder if they're just mistaken. Because Alyssa had already gone running that day. Why would she go again and without telling anyone, which was wildly out of character, and without having her phone ping another location or without having her text somebody? Yeah, that's a little weird. That's a long time for somebody who's social, just not even ever texts back in that span of several hours throughout the day. Plus, this trail is not described as maybe the best place for running in December because of the weather and it's slick. As the search started because they started searching once they realized she was missing a snowstorm hit and the search was stopped on christmas eve because it was too dangerous oh no it was resumed in january but there was not one piece of evidence found what and so that's why i wonder if the car being parked there was to put all of the resources towards searching that park throw it off and that Alyssa actually went missing at the spot in tigard at a a house or something? She was in kind of a, I think it's like a shopping center okay. area. Okay. And she could have just got yanked. I mean, that happens to people. And then her car could have been put there to throw people off track. But nobody's, oh, there's been no sign of Alyssa again. Everybody agrees that she- 15 not that long ago. I know. Everybody agrees she would not have left her son. She would not have left her life. She was described as just like the most supportive. She reminded me of you, actually. That's why I think why I was kept looking at her case because she was like a huge fan of the soccer, local soccer team. And she, mm-hmm. I think she played kickball. Like she was inv- involved in all these extra fun yeah. extracurriculars and she would go running. She had a running group and everybody just described her as super supportive and, and kind and mm. n- nobody's ever found any trace of her. So Alyssa is five foot three, athletic heck? build, black hair, brown eyes. She has a tattoo of a raven and a tattoo of a Korean flag. She is Korean. Anyone who sees Alyssa McCrane is asked to contact the Missing Persons Unit by email, missing at portlandoregon.gov. It's linked in the source notes. But I know that's not a full coverage one, but I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Because I just kept thinking about her. And when and when you search her in newspapers, there's only articles for that week in December, and then there's nothing. So who knows? Maybe somebody has Man. Maybe somebody has seen something. Maybe somebody remembers something. Maybe somebody knows and it's been some time and they're ready to share. So Yes, please come forward. Anyway. Wow. And it's the same thing that kind of happened to her, that weird snowstorm, you know, missing without a trace, not able to pick up a scent, all of those same things. It's crazy because it's so recent too, because you have so much more technology. Like I I was just thinking about it, like they have so much more to go off of because people post on social media now and you get like the cell phone signal stuff. I know. Wow. I just, I don't know that she disappeared there. And I'm sure the police like are like, yeah, we're we're all over it. Thanks. But (laughs) they're like, thanks thanks for your help, Maybe listen to Tea Time Crimes. Yeah. They're like, okay, we got it. And I'm sure they've looked into it and they just can't (laughs) find anything. But anyway. Oh, man. Portland, Oregon, right? Yeah. So listen, I linked Brian's coverage of it. He has a few more details in there that are interesting. And there was at one point a Facebook page for her where people were sharing details. I couldn't, I think it's been taken down now, but uh, he seemed to have access to that and was talking about it a lot. He also got emails from people who knew her and were in her life and he was, yeah. So anyway, those are, wow. That's a compilation of just 
you know, wild cases. Like actually wild, literally yeah. wild. Polly's because really bothers me too. Wild. Where did she go? Yeah. Where did she go? Yeah, there's, I don't know, man. I don't think she left on her own. Did Bessie commit a murder and then I'm on the run for the last, for the next 50 yes. years? I don't know. Definitely. Why is Emery holding dead people in his canoe? I just I have a lot of questions, you know? Yeah. But anyway, what wow. are your last words? I have a few. One, this is cool is not the right word, but it's interesting. I love hiking and stuff like that. So it's interesting to hear about all the national park stuff. And yeah, a lot can go wrong. Yeah, it was really scary. I think for maybe for the Halloween episode, I might talk about some of these urban legends because I found oh. I found some stuff that kept me up. The Rougarou? I don't know what that is. What is it? The Rougarou is a southern legend. Well, I think it kind of reaches up, but it's essentially like a it's almost like a werewolf. Like that's what it looks like. And it creeps around the swamps. Oh my gosh. Yeah, stuff At like night. that. Apparently there's yeah. there's cave people. I don't there's a whole thing. Oh my god, like mole people in the subway system in New York. And then all of the disappearances correlate with where the caves are located. It's, <gasps> all, th- it's all thing. Scary. Anyway, continue. Second. Oh my god. I'm actually excited for that. Second uh, the when you do things that are maybe dangerous or exciting. I or, believe we're talking to the hides right now. Yes. <laughs> Wear helmets, wear life jackets. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe I didn't wear a life jacket on the boat going fishing, but that's she different. didn't. I, I had a life jacket and I saved her from a snake. I, I think we on all a remember. Still lake. Well, I could swim on yeah. on a raging rapid. You know, white. Ra- what do you call that? White water rafting. I wore a life jacket. I've never doggy paddled it. so fast away from that snake. It was a stick. It turned out to be a stick, but we didn't know that at the time. But yes, wear a I, life jacket. Oh, I'm going to drown because I was laughing too hard. Well, that's on you. Yeah. And like also just wear helmets. Like if you're going biking or motorcycling, yeah. just all, wear seatbelts. It, it, it is two seconds that will save your life. Okay. Sorry. That really enrages me because there are parts of the world and country that they just won't use their seatbelts still. It's not the 1950s. Okay. Calm down. Also, don't three. store bones in your canoe. Oh, sorry. Three. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just general. Talk that it's up like, there. Maybe just call somebody. You know what I mean? Don't. Weird. Yeah. Three, uh, have a good sense for how your friends are feeling and don't go overboard on the teasing. You know, everybody has their limits. Is that a personal comment directed at me? No, it's for Polly. Oh. Polly's friends. Well. I'm sure I mean, they felt guilty. I'm not blaming them at all. But this, these are just lessons. I feel like that didn't actually bother her, though. I think they're just thinking back on it and worried about it because you must analyze everything you said and did and I know. Yeah. Every like, breath. Yeah, on that you're right. Hike. And she probably was like, if oh, she could see them, she'd be like, Oh, I didn't care. Them. Some idiot attacked me up over the crest. Yeah, fucking attacked me. But why did she start yeah. walking faster? That I don't care. Maybe because she was being teased. And she's like, Fuck you guys. I'm tired. I want to go get dinner. Lunch. Yeah. She ha- was gonna make spaghetti. She had made homemade sauce. Oh, that's the best. What if she wanted to go for a smoke? And so she didn't want to. Well, then she would just stay behind. That, well, they, I think they thought she was going to run up to that bench and probably sit down. Yeah. Anyway. Actually, I think she just had a cigarette at the turnaround. Okay. I think that's it. But that's, those are wild. Especially yeah. the kid ones. Like, how the Freak fuck? me out. Yeah. Ugh. Crazy. Thanks. Well, teach your kids to forage. All right. Well, <laughs> who should listen? Hikers, search and rescuers, friends, bears. Who else should listen? Emery, don't hold dead people, you weirdo. And then let's throw in like maybe a salmon or two. Could have been on the river. Yeah. In 1928. Yeah. yeah. You never know. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. Please rate, review, like, subscribe, send us a recommendation for teas and crangings, and yeah. we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.